Welcome, everybody, to the university. Next poem is mine, one of mine, for my first publication of stuff. The poem is entitled Testudinal Fortitude, and I must apologize in the beginning. Um, in addition to going to UMD, I've been to a couple other colleges. I have an adequate vocabulary, and I don't use it in a poem just to display erudition, but often, in this case, this is meter and rhyme in it. So I'm finding words that convey the meaning that have the right syllabization to it. Anyway, a few words, uh, faunal flora and faunals, the faunal world, the animal world, um, of noblesse oblige, a three or four hundred year old concept uh, that said uh, benevolent behavior was expected from those individuals who were perceived as persons of high birth. The wealthy owed something to the rest of us mere mortals. Um, sucker, S-U-C-C-O-R, uh, assistance in time of distress. Repast, a meal. Byzantine, elaborately complex. Paroxysm, convulsion. Carapace, a hard bony outer covering on an animal. Two more, talisman, a uh, object supposedly with mystical power, and then genus, like we had in biology class, probably in high school, kingdom phylum class, order, family, genus, species, genus, second from the bottom. Canine would be a genus, dog, wolf, fox would be individuals, or species. Testudinal fortitude. Another sultry afternoon in Florida's infernal heat, I'd felt the need to cut some brush spruce up the lot and make it neat. A power tool I filled with fuel, affixed the saw blade on the end, then sallied forth into the woods, my labor eager to expend. Like some ancestral husbandman who felled his grain with sharpened scythe, successive arcs soon left, left the swath, a path most pleasing to the eye. Though sweat flowed unabatedly and humble task was life sublime as I alone in sunlight worked to forge the land to my design. I slipped into hypnotic trance as straining arms swung fore and back. My thoughts slipped off to other realms as hungry tool waged its, its, its attack. My goal in sight I near the road when I was startled by a thump. I wondered if I'd grazed a rock or maybe sliced into a stump. I paused and probed the undergrowth, the brush so thick I couldn't see, but perseverance soon revealed a critter-colored verdigree. A painted turtle eyed me then, a harmless, affable reptile. No doubt he'd sought a bit of shade as he escaped the heat a while. Then suddenly I froze in place as I was taken quite aback, for oozing blood like yours or mine was that stark gash across his back. With apprehension growing strong as masculinity grew tender, I knelt beside the little guy to see what aid that I might render. When I observed how deep the wound and novel wetness filled my eyes, because as that creature tried to move, I saw his legs were paralyzed. A pang of sadness coursed through me as though I'd injured some dear friend, betrayed some noble sacred trust. If sentient life, do not offend. That by, our, by default our aptitude for love, or logic if you please, implied that humans undertake a faunal world noblesse oblige. Because of our exalted spot, our perch on life's great chain of being, it seemed we shared capacity for empathetic ways of seeing. If this was true, might we embrace a righteous conservation plea? If species take another's life, it not be done capriciously. I struggled then in my own mind to look at life with turtle eyes, but saw that I would soon fall short of those attempts to sympathize. 
It seemed that from his point of view, although I was guiltless in intent, my own self-serving actions had demolished his environment. And my beleaguered mind rebelled. What abject foolishness, it thought. But as I tried to rationalize, the more my soul writhed overwrought. I then was struck by irony, how I was eager in my youth to dash to war on foreign shores to slay my fellow man in truth. With zeal, embraced the combat arts, learned protocol for bayonet, applied myself to marksmanship, aspired to kill without regret, and later years went off to hunt, would scour woods relentlessly while in pursuit of duck or grouse, which were dispatched methodically. But there that day I knelt in grief as I choked up like callow child and wondered why with tearful eye tormenting passions had run wild. I pondered then what must be done, for I felt so responsible to render succor to that beast, a goal quite inaccessible, for he was injured mortally and as with Humpty Dumpty sprawl. No king nor veterinarian could stay the end that would befall. I found for him a shady spot as he was being slowly baked. I clutched my shell with trembling hands as that strange lump in my throat ached. The thought then flashed to leave him there, as though with luck would he be healed. I hoped this might assuage my grief till his salvation be revealed. I nearly turned and walked away and prayed my cross would disappear because the choice which beckoned next led me to one much greater fear. For I could not abandon him, not knowing what would come to pass, to serve as some opossum's lunch or fire ant's prolonged repast. By then were options limited available to my small chum. It was apparent then must I his executioner become. Emotions swept like angered waves as unrelenting guilt did grow. I wondered then at how much grief was it ordained my fate to know. I soon conjectured my ordeal was watched by powers yet unseen who'd orchestrated there below that morbid plot so Byzantine. And by this thought was life made clear as strength of resolution grew. So I went back to get my gun, for I knew then what I must do. A rifle seemed the prudent choice to guarantee the end was quick. I dusted off Dad's twenty-two. A hollow point would do the trick. As I rehearsed his coup de grace, I told myself that I was sure that it was best to take his life. His pain could I no more endure. I then returned to that bleak spot where he lay still upon the ground. I said goodbye with tearful eye, slowly chambered home the round. My aim then eyed the open wound which beckoned there upon his back. As I aligned the front sight blade, the hammer struck with sudden crack. Then in the quiet midday heat, tranquility was coldly riven as my small friend gave up his life in grim, unnerving paroxysm. The shot was true. My task was through. To what extremes had we been driven? Put up my tools and drank a beer and hoped my sin would be forgiven. Two days elapsed before I found the nerve to face my hapless crime, and though begrudged the ants their meal, it granted them free reign to dine. Then I returned, and there it lay, an eerie, hollow carapace. A fence pole served its place of rest, and monument to my disgrace. This tally's man stood many weeks as ghoulish totem in the woods. I'd often make a pilgrimage, ensuring penitence withstood. It then turned fall, I burned some brush and pondered as I watched my fire. Then as I'd felt I'd borne enough, my blaze became a funeral pyre. And looking back, how rash that act, for still I feel I must atone 
to those of genus Testadine will always empathy be shown. So don't get close and tailgate if you're behind me on the road, because often I'll abruptly halt for turtle trudging with his load. And I'm the guy on interstates who dashes right out in the lane to keep potential victims from incurring some haphazard pain. So maybe now you'll understand and see I'm not all that eccentric, but just a man with debts to pay and his whose contrition is authentic. Testudinal fortitude, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. Um, I don't often do that because it's so happy. Um, <laughs> but, but I had divine intervention. Gene and I were driving uh, along a country road, and uh, it was dirt road, and right there, Creeping across the road was the painted turtle. I said, up, oh, got to stop. She, kn she knows this story. So I got out. I had a pair of gloves, which is a fortunate thing. Usually if you pick them up just right, you can get your fingers between the back claws and the front claws. But they've got, this was a little six-inch guy, but they've got some claws to them for digging them. Anyway, so I put them put on the side, and he made some weird noise. It was like, <laughs> And I thought, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you down. Just, it'll be just a second. Anyway, I did a show last year, and we didn't do any Robert service. So forgive those who requested Robert service, because they're going to get some right now. Um, Robert service lived from 1874 to 1958. He became famed as the bard of the Yukon, even though he wrote, with all the stories he wrote, he never got there until eight months after all, or eight years after his works were published with which he made staggering amounts of money. I think his first book generated what in today's money would be three, over $3 million. And he did more writing. And then he, then he uh, be volunteered in World War I to be a stretcher bearer and an ambulance driver, which is where the sentiment for this next poem comes. Um, a couple of words, gargoyle we know, Caliban, Shakespeare, the character, Caliban, anybody? The, uh, the Beauty and the Beast story, the, the, the face of the monster, Caliban, who's lusting after fair damsel. Uh, and there are uh, a couple of French quotes in this. And uh, often I will try to edit these out, but um, it would mess up the rhyme st st uh, stream. So I'll just read the lines. And it's, it, it's, she's saying, the woman is saying, it is I, it is our Marcel, my brother, mon frere, comme je suis heureuse, I'm so happy to hear you. And that's, and then later on, the, the, uh, the fellow is re, uh, referred to as a malheureux, a mal against happiness, so he's unhappy. Anyway, Florette. My leg? It's off at the knee. Do I miss it? Well, some, you see, I've had it since I was born, and lately a devilish corn. I rather chuckle with glee to think how I fooled that corn. But I'll hobble around all right. It isn't that. It's my face. Oh, I know I'm a hideous sight, hardly a thing in place, sort of a gargoyle, you'd say. Nurse won't bring me a glass, but I see the folks as they pass shudder and turn away turn away in distress, mere enough, I guess. OK? You bet I'm OK. But I wasn't a while ago, if you'd seen me even today, the darndest picture of quo with this Caliban mug of mine so ravaged and raw and red, turned to the wall in fine, wishing that I was dead. What has happened since then, since I lay with my face to the wall, the most despairing of men? Listen. I'll tell you all. That fellow across the way with the shrapnel wound in his head has a sister. She came today to sit a while by his bed. All morning I heard him fret. Oh, when will she come, Florette? Then sudden, a joyous cry, the tripping of little feet, the softest, tenderest sigh, a voice so fresh and sweet, clear as a silver bell, fresh as the morning dews. Say toi, say toi, Marcel, mon frère, comme je suis heureuse. 
so over the blanket's rim. I raised my terrible face and I saw how I envied him, a girl of such delicate grace, 16, all laughter and love, as pert as a songbird and yet as tenderly sweet as a dove, half woman, half child, florette. Then I turned to the wall again. I was awfully blue, you see, and I thought with a bitter pain, such visions are not for me. So there, like a log, I lay all hidden, I thought from view, when sudden I heard her say, ah, who is that Malheru? Then briefly I heard him tell how ever he came to know how I'd smothered a bomb that fell into the trench and so none of my men were hit, though it busted me up a bit. Well, I didn't quiver an eye and he chattered and there she sat and I fancied I'd heard her sigh, but I wouldn't just swear to that. And maybe she wasn't so bright, though she talked in a merry strain and I closed my eyes ever so tight, but I saw her ever so plain. Her dear little tilted nose, her delicate dimpled chin, her mouth like the budding rose and the glistening pearls within, her eyes like a violet, such a rare little queen, Florette. And at last, when she rose to go, the light was a little dim, and I ventured to peep, and so I saw her graceful and slim, and she kissed him and kissed him, and oh, how I envied and envied him. So when she was gone, I said in rather a dreary voice to him of the opposite bed, Ah, friend, how you must rejoice, but me, I'm a thing of dread. For me, never more the bliss, the thrill of a woman's kiss. Then I stopped, for lo, she was there, and a great light shone in her eye, and me, I could only stare. I was taken so by surprise when gently she bent her head. May I kiss you, sergeant, she said. Then she kissed my burning lips with her mouth like a scented flower, and I thrilled to the fingertips, and I hadn't even the power to say, God bless you, dear. And I felt such a precious tear fall on my withered cheek, and darn it, I couldn't speak. And so she went sadly away, and I knew that my eyes were wet. Ah, not to my dying day will I forget, forget. Can you wonder? Now I'm okay. God bless her, that little Florette. Florette, ladies and gentlemen, by Robert Service. Thank you.